And there you see the subject. It is time prophecy. Now you have listed on the right side, six time prophecies that come from the book of Daniel. And you find Daniel is rich in time prophecy. Daniel chapter four, chapter seven, chapter eight, chapter nine, and chapter 12, all speak of specific time prophecies that are involved in this list of six. And we'll add a seventh one a little bit later, but it won't be from the book of Daniel. Now I learned years ago from Brother Frank Shalou that Daniel was a picture of the true church during the gospel age. I think he's right. His analysis of it was very intriguing for me. I think his experiences show that, and it helps break down the book of Daniel and understand it. But our point here is simply that these six time prophecies in Daniel all pertain to a fulfillment during the gospel age, fitting for the time Daniel represents. You notice that one of these time prophecies has an asterisk by it, the 1260. That is the time prophecy of the Bible among all of these that is most often referred to. You will find it twice in the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, and then in Daniel chapter 12, verse 7, where it introduces a few others. But that would be not understandable unless we had revelation to supplement it. And in Revelation, we have five distinct mentions of this prophecy that Daniel introduces for us. Now, in the book of Daniel, this prophecy refers to time, times, and a division of time. Now, interestingly, the word time in both 725 and 127 are not the same word, but the thought is the same. And very often, it won't really be necessary to look at the direct word so much as to capture the idea. For example, when Daniel says it'll be for a time and times and a half a time, that the power of persecution by papacy will be over the saints. Well, we have a time, but what is times? Could that be 15, seven, eight? But of course, most likely it's just two. Now the word is not strictly dual in the Hebrew, it's strictly plural. But everybody that I know that introduces a study of the subject considers it to be two. So we have two and a half times, uh, excuse me, three and a half times cumulatively. Now the brethren know that as a, a period from 539 to 1799. That's true, we'll give you some details on that in a moment. But just for now, we've got 1260 on the screen. And yet, as we've introduced the prophecy, it's really time, times, and half a time. How do we get from three and a half times to an accurate count of 1260? The answer is you can't do it strictly from the book of Daniel. As a matter of fact, when Daniel wrote, they were using a lunar year, and it won't have 360 days in the year. It's a prophetic year. But the way we know this is by turning to Revelation, where we see it called 42 months. And 42 months and three and a half years would be the same amount of months as three and a half years contains. And then if we assume 30 days per month, we can compute 1260 days. Fortunately, Revelation 11.3 tells us precisely 1260 days. And so does Revelation 12.6. Revelation 12.14 helps us by reminding us that is time, times, and a half a time. And Revelation 13, five finishes it off by reminding us, yes, that's the 42 months that you saw early in Revelation 11, two. So by that collective means, it's apparent to us that these are 1260 days and in prophecy, a day represents a year. So 1260 years. Now that information was known by brethren for a long time, by brethren of Christian fellowship, well before the Lord's return, before the Adventist movement. We have record of that even before the Reformation. But the question is when? Now it's comfortable for, it's uh, uh, common for us to begin that at 539 and take it to 1799. I believe that's actually right. There were some Christian believers a hundred years before 1799 that expected within that decade that would be the fulfillment. When finally 1799 came, French Revolution a decade before and things turned bad for the papacy, 
that focused our attention on 1799. Now, I would just mention that the way we understand the beginning of this period is by looking a little bit at the history of how papacy came to political authority. Now, you see a map here of Rome where you know the Pope would be from, but taking Rome and putting that in the hands of the Pope, which happened in 538 AD, was not quite adequate to really installing him in political authority in Italy, because Rome at that time was not the capital. It was a place called Ravenna. And Ravenna fell to a general Belisarius who was sent by Justinian from Constantinople to rid the place of the Ostrogoths. Ravenna fell to Belisarius in 539. Belisarius was the general of Justinian. Now, why that's of interest is because, as you'll notice here on this screen, in 533 AD, Justinian had declared the Pope to be the head of all Christian churches. Six years later, the fall of Ravenna put this whole area into the hands of Justinian, and so now his decree could take effect. By similar observation, in 1799, at the end of papacy's 1260 years, the Pope was removed completely. He died a prisoner in France, and that was six years after formally France had abolished Christianity by the Parliament of the French Revolution. Now, we have another factor that I think helps us to understand that 1260 years run from 539 to 1799, and that is that in 799, Charlemagne was crowned by the Pope, a milestone in the incipient form of the Holy Roman Empire, which formally started a few years later. Now, maybe you think that maybe that really was the year 800. I surely did for many years. I was clarified on that by Brother Richard Doctor, who explained, and I've verified this by research as well, that in those days, Christmas Day was the beginning of a count of a new year. And therefore, when you read that it was Christmas Day, 800 AD, when Charlemagne was crowned by the Pope, that actually is the, day, the year that we know as 799, because we don't start a new count of years with Christmas. We wait until a few days later with the first of the new year. It actually was Christmas Day of 799 when that step was taken. And a thousand years later, that power and prerogative was gone. So I think that helps us understand 539 precisely. Now, when we go to the next prophecy, that's only one time in the entire Bible. That's in Daniel 12, and you'll find it in verse 11. From the time that the daily sacrifice be taken away, that is, the ransom is abrogated by the installation of the mass, the abomination set up. Now, you'll find that in Daniel 11:31. That is the foundation for these prophetic days. When papacy was set up and their doctrine of mass was therefore also set up, and the pap papacy who had taught that for some time, now had the political authority to more or less insist upon it. So that says that uh, there will be 1,290 days. And what's going to happen? Nothing is said in verse 11 about what would happen. But if you go back to verse 10, it says, none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise will understand. You remember Daniel wanted to know all about the prophecies he was speaking. The angel said, I'm sorry, Daniel, it's not for your day. It'll be for a later time at the time of the end. And then many will be tried and found. Why. The wicked will not understand, but the wise will understand. And then the prophecy of 1290. Maybe, therefore, the 1290 is when wisdom of the unveiling divine plan begins to be restored to the church. Now, in 1829, there was a movement in England. Actually, it began four years before that. It was a movement in England sponsored by Henry Drummond, a banker in England who was also part of the House of Commons. And for four times a year, three times, excuse me. No, I think, I think it was four times a year. They would meet at Albury Park about 10 hours from London. From 1825 to 1829, 50 gentlemen who were deep students of prophecy, led by Chairman Hugh McNeil of Albury Park. Three times a day, they would meet from nine to 11, one to three and seven to 11. And in 1829, they put together a compendium of what they had learned and agreed on. There were six items that they agreed on. 
Now there's the six items in front of you, but that's just a summary. I'm going to read those six items for you. Number one, Christianity will not gradually fade by a universal preaching of the gospel into the thousand year kingdom. Thousand year kingdom, how about that? They knew about that. But will end by verdicts that the visible church and state are destroyed as once the Jewish state had been destroyed. In other words, like Christ Judaism was judged, so Christendom will be judged. Number two, at the time when these verdicts will come over Christianity, the Jews will be restored to their country. Well, remarkable. Number three, these verdicts will come most heavily on the part of the church most blessed and has the, therefore has had the greatest responsibility. Well, I think that would be papacy who had the most power and opportunity and responsibility. Four, after these verdicts, the thousand year kingdom will commence for the entire human race, even for the unwitting creation. Now that's pretty good. <laughs> Number five, the return of Messiah takes place before the beginning of the thousand year kingdom. Number six, our blessed Lord will return soon. Sounds to me like the wise were understanding. This is published in 1829. Now you find this all in detail in a Herald article from, oh, about 19, about 2003 or so. You find an article uh, that, that pertains to this on the time of, of these prophecies. Uh, I'll give you the details of that, anybody wants to know, but that's where this information can be found. That brings us to the next prophecy, the 1335, and that only is one time also. That's Daniel 12, verse number 12. It's very cryptic. Blessed is he that waits and comes to the 1,305 and 30 days. Now, if that starts in 539, that's going to take you to 1874. And of course, we find the year 1874 by this means from the 1335 days of Daniel, and then add other testimonies as well. Notice what it says. Blessed, if you're waiting at that time. Remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 12. You be like men that wait for the Lord. So this is about waiting for the second advent. And if you're waiting, he's going to knock on the door. And then he's going to bless them, it says in Luke chapter 12. But now he tells you the kind of blessing. He's going to serve them meat in due season. He's going to serve them a rich repast of spiritual understanding. Revelation 3.20 to the seventh church only. I'm not coming. I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. And if you open the door, I will come in and sup with you and you with me. There's the rich peace repast of present truth. Song of Solomon chapter 5 verse 2. I hear the voice of my beloved. He's knocking at the door. That's the way it is with those spirit begotten at the end of the age, if they're attending. Finally, Daniel 12, 1, which is where Daniel 12 began, told us Michael would stand up with kingly authority. And now in the very last verse of this chapter, we find the second to the last verse, we find that would be at the end of 1200, excuse me, 1335 days in 1874. So we have a pretty good foundation when you put it all together for the year of our Lord's return. And we're gonna go on now to another one that's very famous, probably the one that's talked about among the brethren more than any other, maybe. It's the 2,520 years. It's talked about a lot because there was great expectations for that. Those are the seven times that take you from 606 BC to 1914. At least that's what volume two has for us. Now, those seven times are not mentioned in Daniel chapter 12. You have to go back to Daniel chapter four for this. And there you'll find that on four occasions, Nebuchadnezzar was told that he was going to wander like a beast for, and seven times would pass over him. Now, if you go back to Leviticus, the 26th chapter, you'll find also that seven times were to pass over Israel for their disobedience when their temple would be removed and they would be subject to contemporary nations. So in Leviticus, we have it as the punishment for Israel. Four times it's repeated. In Daniel, it's all about the debasement of Gentile governments. Four times it's repeated. And it turns out, that there are exactly four world empires that cover the span. 
Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. Now, this is a well-known prophecy. The brethren looked forward to 1914, thinking that maybe that would be the completion of the church. Even two years before this happened in 1912, Brother Russell wrote an article in which he said, well, you know, we don't know. We don't really know, but we're looking forward to it. We'll see. But we don't pin our hopes on a particular date. Well, this is widely accepted by the brethren today. But there is a problem. And that is the opening date, 606 BC. As most of you will know, whoever put your attention to this before, the real date really is not 606 if you want to end in 1914. It's really 607. That's the date you really must begin at if you want to end in 1914. Now you see this analyzed in reprint 5141, and you'll see that the date intended was really 606. And therefore he suggested maybe it wouldn't be until 1915. Now the problem in the computation here, as you know, is that there is no year zero between BC and AD. And that throws the computations off by one. If you add 606 in 1914, you get 2520, seven times 360. But it's, it's, uh, it's really only 2519 because the zero year is missing. You have to get to 1915. But 1914 came, World War I started. What would you expect? 1914 must have been the end. In order for that to be true, and I think it is true, that means we have to change that date to 607 BC. But how do you do that? Can you just change history? Well, the answer is no. You can't merely change dates at a whim. There is, however, a viable answer. In my opinion, only one answer. And that is to look what actually historically occurred in 607 BC. When you look historically at what actually did occur in that time, you'll find that was the beginning of a four-year campaign by Nebuchadnezzar as the general of his father, Nabopolassar, to conquer the land, the Holy Land, by crossing the river Euphrates, and then year by year, campaigning against the land that we know as the land of Israel. Now, as it so happens, that four-year campaign of conquest ended in 603, the very year that Daniel 2, verse 1 and 37, declared that Nebuchadnezzar, now enthroned as king, was the head of gold. The head of gold had taken place by 603. A parallel date to that, 2,520 years later, would take you to 1918, which was the end of World War II, a four-year war that broke up the old empire of Babylon. But there's more. It turns out that if you really want to look at the history of the First World War as Winston Churchill was partial to do, he wrote a four volume set of history on World War I. And he said that four volumes was called the World Crisis, 1911 to 1918. And he explains how in 1911, the Agadir crisis really set the stage for the war that unfolded. It was really a seven year problem. He even names his book that way. And if you go back to the Babylonian history, find out that actually Babylon's period of authority came when they conquered the Assyrian empire in 610 BC, and then finally they were ruler and master over the kingdom of Judah by 603. So it actually is a seven year beginning and ending. Now, I always say 607 to 1914. That's crisp, that's clean. But it's broader than that when we get into the details. And it's broader than that. You may remember that Abraham said, was told rather by God, after 400 years, the Israelites then will come into their land. Well, there's a parallel to that 400 years. It goes back to the time of the Reformation. And for exactly, again, seven years, from 1511 to 1518, the Ottoman Empire took control of the Middle East and control of Palestine and held it for 400 years until finally, during World War I, they were compelled to acknowledge that the land was to be freed. And England made a declaration, the Balfour Declaration, that this land really should be given for a nation of Israel. Now, if we go back one more step, 
400 years earlier, we actually find a seven year period of the beginning of the kingdom of Judah with King David. And you remember the David's first seven years were in one location, they moved later to another. So those seven years are in parallel exactly 400 years earlier. We'll talk about more of this a little bit later. So another thing we notice about the 2,500 years is that it happens to be exactly double the chief prophecy of Daniel of 1260. Now, is that a coincidence or is that an intended point to recognize that that 2,520 years of the Gentile times actually can be broken into two pieces? Now, we mentioned back here that the people that actually controlled the land of Israel 400 years before it was freed was the Ottoman Empire. They're Islamic. Turns out that Islam really rose its ugly head against the, the empire of, Const of, uh, of, uh, of Constantinople in 654. Now 654, halfway between the, the two parts of the 2520, happened to be, you can look it up on Google as I have done, the Battle of the Masts, in which Islam really defeated Constantinople on the seas and opened up the Mediterranean Sea, which was considered a Roman lake to Islam, which they promptly used to basically convert all of North Africa. And then onward later, even into parts of Southern Europe. So the Islam prospered for these 1260 years. Now that's of interest because notice that in the 1260 years of Christ Christendom's prospering from 539 to 1799, they also have a double if you reflect 1260 years backward. And that was the end, not of the two tribe kingdom, but of the 10 tribe kingdom. 722 is when the 10 tribes went into captivity. Exactly 2,520 years later, the religious governing influence of papacy was, was broken down. Just like here in this 1260 years, the religious governing influence of Islam began to be broken down. And in 539, that's where not Islam, but Christendom began their reign of 1260 years of European authority. So I think that this double of 1260 in both cases helps solidify that we're on the right path, 607 to 1914, 539 to 1799. It's very supportive. Now we're going to go to the 490 years of Daniel chapter nine but that is intertwined with the 2300 days of Daniel chapter eight. So I'll handle those two kind of together. Now, there's been different opinions about how to reckon the 70 week prophecy of Daniel chapter nine. It starts from a decree by the Persian king to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. That's clear from the prophecy of Daniel 924. But where do you begin that decree? Now, Isaac Newton, and William Miller both began it with the return of Ezra. And you'll find that in Ezra, the seventh chapter. As a matter of fact, half of that chapter is consumed with a decree verbatim from King Artaxerxes in his seventh year. However, the, the view of William Miller kind of was a little different. And that is that these seven years might have been pertaining all of them to the ministry of Christ. But we know that Jesus really only had a three and a half year ministry. So if he was right, that means the middle of the week really is what began Jesus' ministry. And then he died at 33. But in the aftermath of the Miller movement, Brother Barber came across a different opinion. And I think largely it was to solve that problem of a seven year ministry. Brother Barber said, no, there's another option. You can begin this with a Nehemiah decree that was 13 years later. But to do that, you have to change the dates of history. The dates of history say that was 445 and that won't work. Uh, so you have to change it by 10 years to 455 to really make that work. And there was a gentleman named Hengstenberg who was a German theologian that favored that view and he wrote very thoughtfully about it. And that's where uh, the, um, the brothers Edgar got the foundation for their view 
and uh, tried to demonstrate that this would work. We have a problem today, however. In those days, 200 years ago, when Hengstenberg wrote and when Miller studied, we didn't really know the history of that time well. And today we do. Today we have the history of that time confirmed really without question. When I say without question, I mean we have more than 7,000 original records that go through this period of time that lock this history down precisely. So what are we going to do with that information? Now I'll show you more about that in just a moment. But I think what that means is we have to focus on this application of the 70 weeks. And I think that that, that actually is correct. 33 AD was really the end of the 70 week prophecy in the midst of the week when he caused the sacrifice and oblation to cease. That's when Paul says in Hebrews, the 10th chapter, sacrifice and offering you would not, but a body you have prepared me. By saying this, Paul says, he takes away the first that he may establish the second. And that's what happened in the midst of the week. The old was done away with because the antitype began. In the first part of the week, that's when you had the activity before the midst of the week of John the Baptist and the preparation for the service of Messiah. Now, I know that it's never comfortable to modify an opinion that is cherished. However, in this case, we really have no choice. Either ignore the testimony of history or understand the prophecy in terms of it. I want to show you two other, uh, three other lists of, of data here. We have actual records of astronomical events in every one of these years of the kings from Babylon through Persia. And again, in this list, astronomical records of every single one of these years. And again, here, we find a record of eclipses in every one of these years of Nebuchadnezzar. Add that to the 7,000 original records that crisscrossed the whole period. And brethren, we just don't have an option. Now, I've known this for probably 30 or 40 years. Brethren, I've talked to, have tried to find an answer. I've talked with them. I've asked them questions. And there is no resolution. There is no resolution. The 70 weeks really began with Ezra in 458 and ended with Jesus on the cross in 33 AD. But a feature of this that did not come to my attention until recently is that in fact, in 458 BC, we began a period of a sabbatic cycle. And it turns out that when Daniel talks about 70 weeks, this is really fulfilled as 70 sabbatic cycles that end with 33 AD. Now, how do we know that there's a sabbatic cycle? Well, we know that because in the book of Nehemiah, the law was read when Nehemiah returned and completed the temple some years later. And that's to be done on Sabbath year. And that would tell us that this year also, the autumn of 458, began a Sabbath year. Secondly, we can count back to the temple in 515 BC when it was completed and realize that's when they began their sabbatical years again. So everything works really quite nicely with this in view. If that's true, then inasmuch as the 2300 years ended, uh, excuse me, began with the 490 years, the 70 week prophecy, that suggests that the 2300 years would really end in 1843. That in fact is what William Miller thought and taught during his ministry. Now, Brother Barber modified that a little bit to 1846, and that's uh, picked up in Volume 3. Everything Brother Barber had in Time Prophecy was picked up in Volume 3. But I think maybe in this case, Brother Miller really had the right date. Now, if that's true, then notice this parallel. Notice that what happened with Brother William Miller, who I think was like a precursor like John the Baptist to the Second Advent work, is he had a date the date turns out to be right, but his expectations were not correct. Now compare that to what happened in the Bible Student Movement in 1914. We had a date 
the date turns out to be right. But the expectations were not precise. I think actually that forms a very nice parallel. Now, there are other opinions under 2300 years. I actually think these other opinions also are correct. The scriptures are very rich. There sometimes is more than one application to a picture or a prophecy. So those of you that might think that maybe the 2300 years began with the Battle of Granicus in 334 or the sack of Rome by the Gauls in 387, one day takes you to 1967 when the temple complex was freed. The other takes you to 1914 when the old order of Christendom began to crumble. I actually think both of those views are correct, but the 2300 years is the prominent one that began with 458. Much more could be said on these. Sorry, we just don't have time to go into detail. Now we notice, now that we've got an ending period for all of these prophecies, here are all the six prophecies and those are the red ending dates. We make an observation. It just so happens that every one of these dates has a predicate 1,845 year, years earlier. It's like a way to double check to see if we're in the right area. Now you all know that 1874 has a parallel 1,845 years earlier. 29 AD is when Jesus was baptized at his first advent. 1874 is when he appeared at his second advent. That's the foundation for the 1,845. As a matter of fact, in the tabernacle, between the beginning of the holy and the beginning of the most holy. That actually has a compartment capacity of 1,845 cubic cubits. Time is against me explaining that, but that's not unique to me. Other brethren have, have said that same thing. So between the first advent and second advent, 1,845 years. Well, between 69 that began that last year of Judah's, uh, of Israel's judgment, and 1914 that began the campaign against old Christendom, exactly 1845 years. By the way, that 69 AD campaign takes you to 73, four years, just like World War I takes us to four years. Now I'm gonna make a request of my, my, my dear wife, if she can turn the volume down just a bit, because I'm hearing a feedback from me, uh, from my own voice, thank you. Uh, now, if you go to 1843 and you go back 1845 years, it does work, three BC. It would not work with 1846. But if you go back 1845 years, you get to the very year that Gabriel appeared in the temple concerning the coming of Christ. Well, what happened in 1843? The foundation for William Miller's understanding of his expectation was that Christ would return, and that was predicated on his prophecy of 2300 years that was given about the temple. And it was given by the angel Gabriel. There's a direct parallel between 3 BC, the preparation for the first advent, and 1843, and the preparation for the second advent. 1829, if you go backward 1845 years, you'll get to 17 BC. So what was that all about? We hardly ever hear of 17 BC. But if you turn to the book of John, and you remember Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. He spake of the temple of his body, but they thought they meant the actual temple. And they objected. They said, no, now wait a minute. That temple has been 46 years in building. You can't just rebuild it in three days. Take 46 years back from 30 AD when he spoke those words. And that's 17 BC when that temple began construction. 1799. Go back 1845 years, and what you find is a prophecy in Daniel, the 11th chapter about Napoleon, fulfilled 1845 years earlier by Julius Caesar. Napoleon in 1798 went to Egypt, conquered, went up the Holy Land, then went back to France and became the king. In 48 BC, excuse me, 47 BC, Julius Caesar, I think I got my numbers off here a little bit, 47 BC, Julius Caesar took Egypt, then traveled up through the Holy Land, then got the call to come back to Rome and became the emperor in 46. 
exactly 1845 years before 1799. Pardon my mistake here on a little bit of a <clears throat> typo there, but it does work exactly 1845 years. 33 AD, it's commonly understood that takes you to back to 1813 BC. I think that is the right date. I think it means something different, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, now that tells us that we're on track with prophecy. We know that the Lord returned. We know that the time of trouble began in 1914. We know these various prophecies of Daniel are on track and only we, by only we, I mean only we, the Harvest Truth Brethren, know how those prophecies really fit. Nobody before the harvest could or did understand. So that's a historical foundation for where we are in God's plan, working toward the kingdom. But you notice that in the process of clarifying some of those points, it was necessary, not optional. Numbers are not flexible. It was necessary to recognize that history unfolded a little differently than what the early brethren in the harvest supposed. We have to then look at the count of years from Adam to the kingdom to see what count of years actually is in force. Now, how did the count of years that we presently are accustomed to come into vogue? How did that capture the attention of the brethren? Well, it's, we know how it happened. After the Miller disappointment, Brother Nelson Barber, who was an avid Millerite, went down to Australia. He was disappointed, kind of gave up on his open of the prophecies. And on his way back from Australia on ship to England, on board was a Christian man. And this Christian man was, uh, well, he was a minister. And he says, why don't we go over the prophecies of Daniel again? They did. They found that some of the problems that they had made. I'd like to talk more about that, but time is against us. So he found that, in fact, the 1335 days would be about 30 years later than they expected. So he went to England and he searched the library to find a count of years that would verify about 1872, 73, 74, within 10 years of that. Now today, when we look at that count of years, there are problems. There simply are. So what is the right count of years that will take us 6,000 years to the kingdom? Well, without going into great detail, what I'd like to do is propose a way of determining the answer. Now we could talk for hours on this point, we won't. We just suggest to you a way. Today, by going back through the, work, right, through the, the history of Israel and Judah, very carefully through the books of Kings and Chronicles, it, people have been able to piece together the date of Solomon's temple as being constructed in 966. Now, I have looked at that very closely for many, many years with a fine tooth comb. They're right. The person that brought this to light was decades after Brother Russell had passed away. What did Brother Russell think about the testimony of Kings and Chronicles in his day? Brother Russell had one comment, only one. This is in question book, page 42 in 1911. Quote, we may see someday just how they can be harmonized, but at present, we do not. What an honest opinion. What an honest forthright appraisal of what we do and do not know. So the testimony of Kings and Chronicles about the kings of Israel and Judea combined was set aside because it was not understood. Today, we do understand it. And it tells us the Temple of Solomon was built in 966. Now, that comes not only from understanding the scriptures directly in Kings and Chronicles, but also we can actually map out the history of contemporary nations with precision that verifies the same result. Okay, I'm just going to lay that on the table. Let's test that. Let's see. And then from there, let's add all the scriptural data all the way back to the time of Adam. Now, all the brethren agree on 1656 years to the flood, 427 to Abraham, and 430 to Exodus. All do not agree on 479 to the temple. That is, however, the statement of 1 Kings 6.1. There's a lot to say about that. We won't say any of that today. Just for the moment, 
let's see what happens if we accept that testimony of scripture. That would tell us that 6,000 years will end 21 years from now. I think that's right. All the brethren know I think that's right. This is not new. I've been talking about this for 20 years. We don't talk about it often because we don't want to disturb the brethren. But the time is getting closer. It's time to look at it and see whether that's credible or not. Now we get back to the 2300 years. If we do accept that history as we think the scriptures require it, then notice that this 1845 years that take us back from 1843, ending in 3 BC, also tell us a 2300 year span of time began exactly at the flood. And 70 weeks of years after that was the death of Sarah, who represents the spiritual part of the Abrahamic covenant that you and I recognize as our spiritual mother. That's the covenant that you and I are being developed under. Heard Brother Jim talk about that earlier today. But that covenant was not operative until Jesus came and the first child of that covenant was born when Jesus died and was raised to life. Exactly 1845 years later. This seems like stunning evidence to show that if we accept the historical date and the scriptures directly, it is very fruitful. I'm going to give three reasons why I think that this is right. Number one, if you do that, when you start with Adam in 3958, that would end 7,000 years in 3043. It is engaging my attention that the 70 weeks of years began exactly at the middle point of the divine plan. You remember what Habakkuk 3.2 said? In the midst of the years, in wrath, remember mercy. In the midst of the years, still while the wrath of God is poured out on all flesh, he remembers mercy and counts the years to the redemption. And then the first age of redemption. And then the second age of redemption. The stars of heaven and the sand of the seashore. Everyone blessed through this great sacrifice. It all begins right there right in the midst of the years. I still remember when that came to my attention. I could hardly believe it. I thought about it for days and days. And then I shared it with some brethren. I think it is vibrantly helpful. Number two, we do know the history of the time from the scripture through the Jubilee cycle. Now, this is a list of all the Jubilees that happened. Our time is short, so we can't dilate on this too much. But according to the Jewish encyclopedia, the 16th, the 16th Jubilee was in the 18th year of Josiah when he had his great Passover. And according to that testimony, the Jewish encyclopedia, the 17th one was marked by Ezekiel 40, verse 1. And if you go back in time, the reason Solomon built his temple in 966, it's because in the midst of a Sabbath year and a Jubilee year which would be number nine. And the first one way back in 1358, it all fits exactly, exactly and precisely. Now we're gonna talk about 17 Jubilees again later, but for the moment, my only point here is that Ezekiel 40 verse one marks a Jubilee. The Jewish people knew historically because of their culture that that was Jubilee number 17. They didn't compute that. They didn't know how to compute all this. They were 100 years off in the fall of Zedekiah. All they knew was culturally, they remembered that was number 16, that was number 17. It exactly, to the year, congeals the timeline that we have suggested. And lastly, 458 BC, The middle of this span is therefore to the millennial kingdom mental to the harvest. One is the beginning of the harvest in 1874. The other is the time of trouble in 1914. The other certainly would be the end of the harvest, whatever date it would be. And thirdly, we'd like to suggest the time when Israel was reestablished as a nation in 1948. Now it turns out that all four of those dates 
are exactly verified by historical dating of these events. Jeremiah had a 40 year ministry. Jeremiah tells us the date when he began in the first chapter, and we know when Zedekiah was overthrown in the last chapter. So that was 40 years. Those 40 years exactly parallel the 40 years of service of Brother Russell. Now, Jeremiah didn't die then, Brother Russell didn't die then. But the 40 years of his ministry was the 40 years of his great influence, and likewise of Brother Russell. I think Jeremiah was a little picture of the seventh messenger in this respect. And if you go further to Daniel, the seventh chapter, you'll find the date when the four governments that were going to take away the national existence of Israel were itemized, the Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. So that is exactly 2,500 years before Israel's national government was reestablished. It fits perfectly. By these three methods, dear brethren, I think we have a good confirmation spiritually that we're on the right track. Now, what did Brother Russell actually say about the millennium? This is not well understood. There has been debate on this issue for a long time. And when we're in debate, we sometimes have trouble looking past the arguments to the actual evidence. In the year 1900, in reprint 2739, somebody asked this question. The scripture declaration respected the saints as they lived and reigned a thousand years. And he cites Revelation 24 and 6. When is that going to happen? That's the question. That whole article is simply one question. And the answer was, this reign of the saints cannot properly be said to begin before all the jewels have been gathered. In other words, the testimony of Brother Russell on this point was that a thousand year kingdom would begin after the church is complete. Reprint 5115, reprint 5604, reprint 5692, reprint 5919. I can't read them because of time. Every one of them talks about the thousand years. Most of them refer directly to Revelation 20, verse 4 and 6. All of them future. Now, this isn't easy for me to say. Because I had the thought that that began with the Lord's return. But now I'm persuaded both that that is not the actual count of years. And secondly, it is not actually what we are led to believe by the words of the seventh messenger. Now, as a matter of fact, some of you might be thinking, as I would have thought, maybe there's other reprint articles that say something different. There are other reprint articles that talk about a thousand years starting with 1874. Not even one of them, not a single instance have we been able to locate or found by inquiring of brethren to locate them for us that cites Revelation 20 verse 4 or verse 6 and suggests that that began in 1874. Not a single case. That was an eye-opener to me when I realized it. Now, when actually will the kingdom begin? Well, we have a seventh time prophecy that starts really in the book of Ezekiel. Daniel belongs to the gospel age. Ezekiel belongs to the millennial age. Ezekiel 40 verse one, I would like to demonstrate scripturally why that is a time that begins the last Jubilee of Israel, but time is against me and I can't point you to the scriptures opening the book that tell us that, perhaps later. But I'd like to flip over now to Ezekiel the 46th chapter, verse number one. Ezekiel 46, 1, which talks about the millennial kingdom. Thus saith the Lord God, the gate of the inner court that looks to the east shall be shut the six working days. But on the Sabbath it will be opened, and on the day of the new moon it will be opened. Whoa. Are those gates today open or closed? Those gates of accessing mankind to God are closed by common consent. Therefore, according to this testimony, are we on day six or on day seven? We'd still be on day six before that Sabbath millennium has commenced, but also the day of the new moon. Now, this goes back to 2 Kings 4.23, where there's reference to the two things. I have to pass that right by. Sorry, we'll talk about that some other time. But it also shows the day of the new moon and the Sabbath to be the time 
when Israel will be have life breathed into them and live by faith again, which will happen after Armageddon. I like to talk about the 7,000 years for mankind and the seven days for the church and how we are in the seventh day for the church, but we have not yet reached the seventh day for the world, but no time. I'd like to talk about the night watches to show the same lesson and that midnight in Matthew 25, six was the time of our Lord's return. But midnight in Exodus 12, 29 at the seventh plague is still future at the beginning of this, the third watch of the night. But we'll have to pass that by. We're gonna go on to one, I'm gonna finish, skip the Jubilees. I'd like to explain how the Jubilees point you to 1874. I'd like to show how they point to 1878. I'd like to show they how they point to 18, 1948. They point to all three of those dates, but we must go on. Here's the flood. This is our last point that we have on our agenda. The flood was an episode that represents a large part of the divine plan. Peter the apostle tells us that the redemption in the ark represents our redemption in Christ. That the flood waters surrounding the ark are a picture of our baptism into Christ. We can't be baptized in Christ until 33 AD when he died and was raised again. And then 40 days it rained, a day for a year it takes you to the end of the judgment upon Judaism. But five months before they were, while they were floating, before they came aground would represent five, the new creation, the time of the gospel age. And finally, they come to the end of the age in 1874. From the day that they landed the ark until the day they threw off the covering of the ark and saw that the curse was lifted, which was exactly at the beginning of the seventh century of Noah's life to the very day was 169 years, 169 days, the same number of days as from 1874 to 2043. I'd like you to show you how that's computed exactly and what it depends on another time. Now let's go a little farther. Notice that when the flood actually began, until 33 AD when the antitype actually began is the sum of two very meaningful years. The 1335 days that take you to the Lord's return and the thousand year kingdom of Christ that begins 169 years later than that. Is that a coincidence? You remember these dates were not of our assemblage. They're simply the dates using the date of Solomon's temple and adding the scriptures backward. And yet it comes out to mark both of those prophetic markers. But if we go from the flood all the way to the end, what we get is 1845, which is a number that marks the Lord's return, and 2500, which as we have seen is a period of time that marks the beginning of the thousand year kingdom. Is this just coincidence? This is remarkable testimony, brethren. It's fixed in my mind. I believe brethren were on the right track. <laughs> I don't want to be too insistent. I'm excited. I'm not insistent. There is more brethren. And down here from the flood to the time of the Lord's return is a sum of the very year, that, the number of years that takes us to 1914. So it reminds us of the next meaningful date, 1914, and the date when the flood came, 1656, which is a picture of the end of the Jewish, of the gospel age, and the introduction to the kingdom. One more, and that is 74 days after they landed, they saw the top of the mountains out in the distance, exactly taking us to 1948. Only one more, and then we're done. When they finally saw that the floodwaters were abated, they didn't get out of the ark. They stayed in the ark because it's muddy out there. And that mud represents the presence of the influence of sin that continues during the thousand years until mankind is perfected at the end. Now, ages are too long to give a day for a year. That's why the flood was, this gospel age is represented by five months, the millennial age by 56 days. You remember Micah 5.5, 5, when God delivers Israel, he will raise seven kings, the church, and eight princes, the ancient worthies. And those are the influences that are going to rescue mankind 
during the thousand year kingdom. Well, dear brethren, that's our, pref our suggestion for today. I know that there's so many details here, so many involved. I think we're trying to build upon the prophecies of Daniel that are the foundation for the understanding of where we are in God's plan. Are we 21 years away from the hope that each one of you have had for the majority of your life? Dear brethren, I believe we are. What does that mean for us? What does it mean for me? It means for me, the days are finishing when we have the last opportunity to redouble our efforts to find the last grains of wheat before the dark night begins to set in. The storm that closes this period finally engulf our activities and the high calling gradually draw to a close. Dear brethren, we're not insistent. We are deeply persuaded. If you were deeply persuaded, would you venture to share what you think is true from scripture? I think you might, <laughs> I would, but I don't wish to be insistent. Thank you, dear brethren. We turn it back. Thank you for your patience. Lord be with you all.